South Dakota's educational effort to raise awareness about the importance of soil health continues. The USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service entered into a cooperative agreement with the South Dakota No-Till Association and iGrow South Dakota State University Extension for delivering these seminars with the latest soil health and productivity technology to South Dakota farmers and ranchers. Bly is currently serving as the SDSU soil field specialist based in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Anthony was raised and is still active in farming in the family farm near Sioux Falls. He received his undergrad and master's degrees from SDSU and worked from 1992 to 2011 with SDSU's plant science department soil group. In 2011, he left the SDSU to help start Ag Lab Express, a soil tissue and manure testing lab located in Sioux Falls. Uh, he serves in his current position with the SDSU Extension since the fall of 2013. And Dr. Dwayne Beck, I'll read that too so you can just jump up here when it's time. Uh, Dwayne Beck is currently the manager of the SDSU Dakota Lakes Research Farm near here. He has managed the research farm for 25 years with diverse no-till cropping systems. The strong proponent of no-till systems, he is recognized worldwide for his research and efforts in this area. Okay, with that, Anthony, I will turn it over to you. Here. It's working now? Yep. We're putting the back here because we had some trouble before, but Jason, hey. sound okay? Yeah, okay? Okay, thank you, John. Yeah, um, I guess when we were putting the program together, we talked about possible topics, and, and there is a, a number of research projects just dedicated to no-till, and I, I would bet we have quite a few producers here that are And so, uh, Coming before you with that, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Sarah Bird uh, here as well. Um, she's the uh, actually the research manager for soil fertility and testing projects, and uh, without her help, a lot of this, well, all of it, wouldn't have probably been possible uh, that I'm going to talk about. And then I'd like to also acknowledge Dr. Ray Ward and Ward Laboratories. Um, I have the uh, some uh, res soil testing results for the Haney test that uh, he did for me, and I uh, appreciate that very much. But uh, just to kind of lead into what I want to talk about today, uh, um, I'm going to be heavy on nitrogen today, and, and, and just a thought provoker here, I uh, got the price of urea over the last 10 or so years and the price of corn, and so which one is driving which one? They look pretty, pretty parallel, quite frankly. And uh, the, uh, the, urea, the urea price maybe is, is following the corn price a little bit, but uh, it's kind of hard to tell. But we see those peaks and valleys and, and uh, drastic one here in 08, of course, with the economic problems back then. But uh, basically, those peaks line up pretty well. So nitrogen, very important in uh, corn production. Um, and so we're going we're gonna to work on that a little bit. First of all, the South Dakota nitrogen rate calculator that we currently have is up there at the top. Yield gold times 1.2 minus the soil test in the top two feet and minus the legume credit. I have a few, three scenarios there. If you change that coefficient from 1.2 to 1, what that does to the, the nitrogen recommendation, and it drops it about 35 pounds, which is, is very significant. So. Really, this uh, calculator gives you a, a lot of flexibility. You're looking at what's left in the soil in the nitrate test. You're looking at a previous crop, if it's a legume, and you're looking at your yield goal. And so it's really tailored to your operation, uh, more so than what the uh, price ratio approach does here uh, from Minnesota or eastern states. And so what I did is I made a table um, uh, comparing the price of urea, 375 to 425, and then the price of corn. And so their recommendation when you have 350 corn or 375 urea would be 103 pounds of nitrogen per acre. Um, what I really wanted to point out is, is there's not a lot of difference on this table, is there? It doesn't look like it's very flexible. And so hence, hence I think the importance for a calculator type approach for nitrogen uh, it does give you that, that more flexibility on your operation. Now that coefficient is, has not been static. It's been changed over the years. In 1975, it was near 1.5. In 82, they changed it to 1.3. In 91, they changed it to 1.2. In 
And we're currently working on that again. And uh, so the bulk of what I'm going to talk about is, is about that recalibration work. There is a note up in the corner that currently for no-till we do add 30 pounds or do we, we do recommend that. Um, and, and quite frankly, that recommendation came from some very short-term no-till, um, five to 10 year no-till work. And so as we get into longer term no-till, um, we're hoping that the need for that extra end isn't there. And that just comes from the fact that we're building organic matter really rapidly and that carbon to nitrogen ratio wants to balance out. So we need some extra end to do that. And I think I have some data that will support that. And here's uh, the data that we use to get that extra end uh, recommendation for no-till. We have side-by-side uh, -side comparisons of uh, tillage and, and, and there with till and no-till at the Beersford station in 1998. We also have some other data from, from Brookings and, and I believe Watertown too. But basically they show the same thing. When you, when you plot out these uh, nitrogen response curves here, you see that the maximum yield is reached a little bit later in the no-till. It's, it's essentially similar to the till, but uh, there's about a 30 pound difference. So when we look at that difference, that's where that extra end recommendation is coming from. Currently, Sarah Berg, uh, who I previously mentioned, is working on her master's degree. And part of that, uh, her work, her research work, is, is looking at this uh, uh, and, and trying to, to see if it's going to change. And her project at Beersford is on a long-term conventional till, no-till site. And, and hopefully, uh, that impact will be measured there. <coughs> So just looking at uh, uh, most all of the nitrogen data in South Dakota from the last uh, 20 or so years, uh, plotted on a relative scale. I know you like to see bushels, but uh, basically a relative scale. So what that means is that any one of these points below here was a response to add it in, below that 100. And so we can see as we increase uh, soil test in and fertilizer in, our, our response goes up pretty typical nitrogen response curve. But there's some interesting things here as well. Um, uh, our first uh, maximum yield point is attained there, about 110 pounds of N. And, and then there seems to be an inflection point here where, where uh, we're coming together at maximum yield no matter what the rate at about 180 pounds of N per acre. So between those two points gives us that range of what we can work with, with yield goal and, and soil testing. Um, I did put uh, separate the no-till and the tillage apart to see if there's any relationship there and, and, and the, the responses are the same. You add in the no-till, you get a yield response and it's similar to conventional till. Summarizing the data a little bit here, uh, I took the, uh, the mean or the average of the check plots for conventional till and no-till. We see that, that uh, because of the tillage and the mineralization of the organic matter and the nitrogen being produced from that, we get a higher check plot yield at 124 bushels per acre. The no-till, uh, somewhat less at 70. And so uh, we're, we're holding that nitrogen back and, and we're, we're, we're holding it in the soil and uh, we're not mineralizing it out as we build organic matter in that no-till. We take that 54 bushel yield difference and just put one pound of N on that and assign that, we get about 54 pounds of N. We look at uh, conventional till max yield versus no till, what do we see? We see, see essentially the same number, don't we? So across all those site years, uh, for that 20 year period for our nitrogen work, maximum yield uh, essentially the same for both of those tillage systems. Now if we look at the soil test uh, in the soil after we do that work in those check plots, we see in that conventional till uh, check plot soil 63 pounds of ant left in the top two feet versus that no-till at 46, so a lot less there, uh, and hence due to that uh, reduced uh, mineralization uh, because of the lack of tillage. And so the difference there, about 17 pounds. So if we sub subtract the 17 from the 54 here, we get about that 37 pound deficit, don't we? And it's pretty close to that 30 pounds of extra end that we recommend for no-till. Again, it goes back to building organic matter, and we need to main, build nitrogen as well as we build carbon in the soil. So I think with co cover crops and, and improving the biology in the soil with longer term no-till, maybe we'll see that go away. And, and, and that's, that's what we're talking about. 
So in 2013 and 2014, uh, this is a, a look at where we did our uh, recalibration work for nitrogen. You can see in the red all the no-till sites that we had and the yellow, the conventional till. You can see it's heavy on the no-till, isn't it? Um, I don't know why that is. I've got a lot of no-till in South Dakota, obviously, but uh, that's the way it is. We may have some holes in here where we need to fill in some sites, but uh, other than that, it's heavy on the no-till. So at these sites, I want to quickly just say what we do. You know, we, we, we find a grower we want to work with, one who works with us. We just go identify a place in the field, take soil samples. The grower doesn't apply any fertilizer to that site. Uh, he agrees to maintain the weeds and the pests and, and plant, the, plant the crop. And after he does that, we go out and flag those plots and we apply our nitrogen rates. Um, and any other fertilizer that's deficient, we would apply at that time too. So throughout the growing season, we monitor that. And uh, in the fall, we come back and hand pick those plots because they're very small. And we have a lot of plots in one area. So if it isn't an example of precision or site-specific farming management, I don't know what is because it's a very small spot that we're doing that work on. And then after the field harvest uh, is harvested by the grower, we come back and take soil samples of selected plots to see what's left in the soil. This is a plot plan for one of those sites in, in, in uh, Lyman County near Kennebec. Uh, so very small, 15 feet by 30 feet. And you can see our end rates here are randomized by replication. We have four replicates. And, uh, and uh, we are using Super U, uh, which is urea with DCD and agritane on it. So it protects it from volatilization as well as uh, nitrification. So we're, we're slowing down that nitrification. The reason that we went to Super U is because you almost got to sign your life away if you want to buy ammonium nitrate. So in, in uh, soil fertility research, that kind of hurt when we couldn't get ammonium nitrate. And so that's why the Super U. So this is the, uh, the responses for 2013. Looks kind of like a mess, but uh, that's what it is. Got some sites here that aren't responsive, that had high uh, soil test nitrate at the beginning of the season, and then we got some real responsive sites. And you can see that Spig County site was up here 260 bushels per acre at maximum yield. Uh, the 2014 site, uh, basically all of them very responsive to nitrogen rate. You can see uh, nitrogen rate here across the bottom. So very nice yield response curves there at all the sites. Now I want to talk about estimated optimum nitrogen rate. And we do this for every site. And we come in and we uh, determine maximum yield. It's uh, basically an average of those top yields that aren't any different from each other. These yields are all the same. So we draw a line through that at, at, uh, at that average of those points back to the, uh, the linear line related to the rates. And so we just come down where they intersect and we get the optimal end rate at that site was 98 pounds per acre. Okay? That's how we determine optimal nitrogen rate at that site. Now there's many other ways to, to look at nitrogen use efficiency. This is the one that Dr. Ron Gellerman taught me and so I guess this is the one I'm going to use. But I'm also uh, aware of maximum return to nitrogen, economic optimum nitrogen rate. There's a lot of different ways to look at that. So if we look at, um, excuse me, um, so that coefficient is determined from that uh, maximum yield divided by that optimum nitrogen rate, plus the soil test in at that site, plus the legume credit. We had soybeans there previous to that. And so that comes out to be 1.02 pounds of N per bushel of corn at that site. Okay, so if we look at those coefficients for all those site years from 2013 and 2014, we can see that the average, the overall average of 2013 is about one, and it is also about one in 2014. And so Ron saw me give this talk at another place. He said, boy, that's really good data. That's really neat. He said, uh, uh, usually it's a lot messier than that. So hopefully if we get a chance to do this a third year, um, we can get uh, more data as well. Now in 2013, since we had uh, no-till and conventional till, I, I just separated that out and essentially they're the same. <coughs> Corn just needs a certain amount of N and it doesn't care how, how it gets it. It's just gonna need it um, as well. So, so um, kind of going into the Haney test that I talked about that Dr. Ward ran for me. Um, 
the Haney nitrogen wreck, as I understand it from discussing uh, with people that know a little bit more about that, is it, it considers the yield goal and a factor of one pound of N per bushel. And uh, it also subtracts out the organic nitrogen that's in the soil. Um, I got that wrong, I should say inorganic nitrogen in the soil, the nitrate and the ammonia, and uh, the potential organic end release from the soil. And that potential uh, organic end release is determined from the carbon to nitrogen ratio and the Solvita score. And that Solvita score is just a quick respiratory test of the soil to see how the microbes react in a 24 hour period. I'll just leave it at that. But uh, Ward Laboratories uh, says that they'll, their uh, organic end uh, release will never exceed what they measure in the soil. So it's capped at what they actually measure at the time that that sample was taken. And so generally, um, a, a soil with a higher soil health score will have more organic end release. And they, if you've done a Haney test in some of your samples, you get back a whole bunch of data. And uh, the interpretation of that is what, what this inorganic agronomist is trying to understand. So I'm really lacking in the biology part of that, but, but anyway, uh, that's what, how it works. So what I did <laughs> to try to bring all that data together in this very complicated thing is, these are all our insights from 2013 and 2014, what type of tillage, um, and then an estimated yield goal for that site. Now, if I'd have had a little more time, I would have called every cooperator and said, what do you think your yield goal is at that site? But I used my best knowledge and where the location was to kind of estimate a yield goal. And uh, we got the, the estimated optimum end rate for each one of those sites. You can see there's quite a bunch of variability in there as well. And so then I calculated what the university recommendation would have been for each one of those sites at 1.2, our current, and 1.0, and then the Haney recommendation that I got from Dr. Ward's lab. And so I just determined the difference between those three procedures for determining nitrogen rate. And so you can see that our 1.2 equation is really overestimating nitrogen, uh, nitrogen rate nitrogen recommendation. And we know that, and the data from 2013 and 14 shows that. And so I just did the one as well, and we get a little bit closer. We still have a couple in there that are pretty big, uh, but, but uh, we're a lot closer. And then the Haney seems to be, you know, pretty close to the 1.0. And it should be, because we, they both use 1.0, don't they? Although the Haney is using, um, that expected organic end release and the 1.0 equation it, it's kind of built in with that because we measured the yield after the year that we applied the end and we got mineralization so it's, it's kind of built in so if we look at the average our current recommendation 1.2 is way over at 67 pounds the 1.0 is, is closer at 31 and the Haney at 39 so so a good comparison there of, 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 those, of those ways to get that nitrogen recommendation. Is there any questions about that? I'm kind of going to switch here a little bit. The Haney doesn't use the deep nitrate, so. No, it doesn't. No, for the university one does. So, okay. So another study that was done this year at no-till corn, uh, uh, looking at this side dressing, top dressing, whatever you want to call it, um, can we take some of these uh, fertilizer materials such as ESN, uh, polycoated urea is what it is, or super U, and can we kind of in a sense say that that's our side dress or our top dress? Because really what those fertilizer materials are designed to do is delay that end transformation later. So it would be like you went out and put on nitrogen later. And so uh, at a site, uh, we had uh, eight treatments. And uh, the bulk of those treatments were made at 80 pounds of N. We're not looking for maximum yield. We're looking for sensitivity between our treatments. But we did put out a 200 pound rate to see if we had attained maximum yield with those 80s. And, and you can see we did because 200 pounds of N gave us almost 200 bushels of corn 
and the rest of those treatments are, are you know, in that 160, 70 bushel range. So now taking a look at what we did, we had one treatment, 100% urea, applied 100% pre-plant. Now this is on the soil surface. The second treatment was 100% urea, but we did 50 pre-plant, 50 top rest, and the top rest was at V6, V7 growth stage. The fourth treatment was 50% urea, 50% ESN, the poly-coated urea, so it's a slow-release nitrogen, at all at pre-plant. The fifth treatment was 100% at Super U, at all of it at pre-plant, 100% Super U split, and then 50 ESN, 50 Super U pre-plant, and then our 200 as well. So you kind of see what we're trying to look at there. Does using a uh, combination or a blend of these nitrogen sources, does that, does that support higher yield? And can it mimic uh, top rest or side rest? But, but when we look at the yields, basically all these are the same. So there really was no effect of, of, of that ESN or that Super U. One little note is, is, is uh, treatments with ESN had the lowest yield, 161 and 167. And it has been noted that ESN is, is, is known to hold on its end too long. And, and so I think that's evident here, it could be. But again, those were not different. So uh, just, to, just to try at, uh, instead of running that equipment across that field in that top dress or side dress, can we uh, blend up some different fertilizer materials and get that, get that out there, so. Okay, I'm gonna, Diverge away from nitrogen, and I need to talk about soil health because it's what I believe in, and and I and basically uh, ever since I started in this soil work. But I uh, got four pictures here taken about a month ago, maybe a month and a half. Um, not too far from where I live. I hope they're not too dark. But uh, four pictures, uh, probably. Oh, this one here, and these three are about two miles apart fields that I know and uh, so can anyone point to the no-till field yeah are you seeing a lot of dirt in the ditches this this winter yeah I am too saw it last winter as well I think it's worse this winter in some cases I wish there's a way we could measure it but there isn't so um, this is what they are um, a low residue crop no-till leeward side of the field so most of the wind is blowing that snow off not enough residue to catch it is there but it's clean <coughs> okay it's clean um didn't think here we got the conventional till low residue as well same crop no tillage nothing going on soil surface has got soybean residue on it but we see black snow there as well okay i don't remember that happening when I was a kid. Maybe I wasn't paying attention. You know, in FFA and 4-H and going to college, I just didn't see a lot of black snow. But but this, this one, you know, that's kind of, that's interesting. So then we'll go to the low residue conventional till with fall anhydrous ammonia. <coughs> Maybe a little bit more than this situation. Pictures really don't tell the, the whole truth, but I tried to do the best I could. And then we'll go to this bad one down here, low residue crop, conventional till, bailed it off, and fall anhydrous ammonia. And the soil out there, that's soil, that, that's on top of snow. That's not bare soil. And so it's really blowing. And so, yeah, there's, 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 there's a need for keeping the soil covered. How am I doing, Dwayne? <coughs> Can't see it. <laughs> on racing. Okay, I'll go on with this. Just wanted to point out some other research on the farm there uh, uh, that we we want to promote and do with the send and avail on on Al Miron and Nate Strosheim's farm near Crooks. I wanted to share with you what they are they were doing, inviting me to participate in that. Basically, wanted to evaluate a send, a growth promoter, growth regulator, and a bale. Uh, polymer that uh, is supposed to make phosphorus more available and so I'm going to explain to you what they did this is their planter and uh, 
It's a planter, of course, with two uh, split boxes here that uh, supply seed to each half of the planter, and then they pull a Montag cart with their fertilizer. And so with the Ascend, they did basically did a split planter comparison where they put seeds without Ascend in one box and seeds with Ascend in another and planted the whole field. I think they did 200 plus acres that way. And kept track of where they were. And it's very important to do your technology right in your cab when you start planting that field and, you know, so market where you're at. So with the Avail, they've used the same planter situation, but they only have one fertilizer container. So what they did is they put fertilizer in the, in, in the Montag without Avail on it and planted 80 acres every other planter pass. So every 80 feet they planted. And then they put fertilizer in there with Avail on it and then they filled in. Okay, so we have strips, 16 row strips all across the field with or without a veil. And again, uh, Al Miron and Nate Strohschein farm. And so we measured some things. Uh, I had two hybrids with the Ascend, with and without, didn't make a difference on the plant dry matter. And I dug roots and weighed those roots, and there wasn't a difference with the root dry matter either. With either, with either hybrid. I did a combination and nothing there as well. The ascend rate was 1.6 ounces on 8,000 seeds. That's the ascend rate. I looked at corn emergence uh, throughout the early part of the growing season, and if you remember, at least in the eastern part of the state, we were really cold, and it took a long time for, for corn to come out of the ground, and this is pretty evident here. Uh, this corn was planted the last few days in April, and I started, uh, I didn't count any, any plants on May 21st, and, and so it was struggling. And so really a perfect situation for a growth regulator promoter to really do its job, I would think. So as we see, as I returned and counted more, we see a nice increase in stand there across <coughs> these dates. Uh, two of those measurement dates were significant for Ascend. Ascend, Ascend did have pl higher plant population here at uh, May 23rd with uh, this hybrid and on May 30th for, for the other hybrid, but the other, side, other sampling dates were not significant. Another caveat here is both of these hybrids were planted at the same rate, and it uh, looks like the conditions were a little bit harder on the one of them. Looking at plant nutrient uptake, again with those two hybrids, and statistically no differences in all of those uh, measured uh, nutrients there either. This is the field that we did the, or they did the ascent work in. Uh, the two hybrids here, uh, the one hybrid showing a little higher yield here in this part of the field and the other with lower uh, yield there in that part of the field. Uh, yields here looking at all of the data points from the yield monitor for these two hybrids, 179 there for uh, with and without ascent and 198, 200 with and without ascent for that hybrid as well. Now we, uh, we wanted to kind of do some statistics because good infield research generally has very low coefficients of variation. You can really do some good work and, and get down to some really small comparisons. So what we did is uh, Joe, my buddy at Brookings at SDSU, he's the uh, um, ag leader technology expert. He went in and he cut out each pass and gave me the yield for each pass. And so I generated uh, 16 reps of data for 48.12 and 33 reps of data for 53.56. And when you have that many reps, you can really crank down on an LSD. However, the uh, 48.12 was not significant there in that comparison. Very, very little difference. But the uh, 53.56 was, but it went against the sin, didn't it? 210 versus 208, basically. And so non significant. Who would have known, right? There's that field. Then we go on and look at the avail. Uh, the treatments that we put out um, um, were a control without avail, of course. We did 65, 75, 65, 22, uh, about three inches from the row when he plants, okay? And then uh, the treatment with avail, uh, about a half a gallon per ton on DAP. Uh, got on a little more, and they don't. We don't know exactly why that happened, but we can attribute to the fact that that fertilizer 
may have been a little over here. It flowed a little bit better. And so the rate just went up. And so uh, 70, 81, 70, 22, 2.2. Those are the rates. Not a huge difference, but enough to report and tell, tell you about. We look at plant tissue data from uh, replicated plots out there. Uh, no significant difference in, in any of those as well. Looking at yield uh, for all the grain points across the field from the yield monitor, here's the field. Uh, without a veil, 176. With a veil, 178.6. Again, is that different? I don't know. I, we have to really do some statistics. So I had Joe do that again, go in and spe specifically tell me the yield of each strip. So I had 13 replications there. And by golly, uh, with or without a veil, 176.3. Uh, with 178.4, are they significant? They sure are, because the CV is under 1%. Okay, that's what makes them significant. But if you look at the net return to just the veil and don't look at the extra nutrients, it's only seven cents an acre. So, just wanted to share that with you as well. If you have any questions, I can sure sure answer them, and I'll. Turn it over to Dwayne. I think I used about all my time. Being stuck between lunch and you guys, it's an interesting spot. It's the only thing that can be worse than that is being between you and happy hours. So at least we're not doing that. <laughs> commonality, commonality among tillage tools. All tillage tools destroy soil structure. All tillage tools increase, decrease water infiltration. All tillage tools reduce organic matter. And all tillage tools increase weed. Ruth and I spent a couple weeks in the UK and France and we saw enough damn tillage to do us for the rest of our lives. Uh, tilling up and down hills and, and those kind of things. And we're there with a group, uh, speaking to a group of guys that are trying to do the right thing, but it's very, very, very difficult uh, because of their farm programs and stuff and because of the mentality in the schools like Mitchell Tech, the ag colleges or ag schools that they have to go to in order to be able to farm, get a license to farm. And <clears throat> it's all tilled around. They have their own little fields and everything's all over the bottom. So we <clears throat> had some frank and open discussions about those things when we were there. <laughs> uh, tillage is to agriculture what fracking is to petroleum. Think about that. They both increase the speed and extent that resources can be extracted. And they both leave the resource degraded. And I told the people in Europe that my ancestors left there to come here to find some new land to degrade. <laughs> That's true. And they did very good and they used their money and they sent me to college and all that stuff, but we can't do that anymore. And I saw all this mess in France and the UK, and, and then I went to Ghana, and I found truly sustainable agriculture in the rainforests of Ghana. It's totally amazing. You know, and if you have Warren, uh, Howard Buffett's book, just read that chapter on Sophie Bowie. He's quite a guy. Okay? We take out the organic matter, which is what we've been doing, and that's the thing Cheryl didn't talk about in terms of salinity is that after we get forgot that, Cheryl, you had all them other slides in there, and you just didn't have time. You could have given her two semesters, and she could have got through that all. <laughs> when you decrease your organic batter, you decrease the water holding capacity of the soil. And that makes that salinity thing wor worse, because when you get a rain, 
your soil doesn't hold as much anymore. Your bucket's much smaller and you move more water down to the water table, which is moving that water table up. So that's the other factor. And the answer, she showed us the answer, is we put in perennial sequences. That's what we need to do. And we've known that for years. And we need to do that for rotation. And we need to tell some congressmen and senators and whatever that we need farm bills that allow us to do those kind of things. Okay? High disturbance techniques uh, increase weed pressure and cause tillage erosion. We saw a lot of this in France and the UK. Places where they just had nothing but chalk on top of the hill. <coughs> Limestone soils. If they, all they had left on top of the hill was limestone. They were plowing up and down the hill. Or in some cases they were plowing down the hill because they couldn't have them a big enough tractor to plow up the hill. <laughs> so they just plowed down the hill, drove empty up the top and plowed down. And the reason they're plowing the hillside is because when they had animal traction with cows and horses, you couldn't plow the hillside. They were too steep, but now they can't. So they are. And you go look at everybody's castle and these nice castles they have, and all around that castle, the soil is degraded. So then they move someplace else and build another big ass castle. And you, you've got to go see their castle. I really kind of lost interest in looking at castles after about the fifth one. Because all you saw is this. You saw the erosion around there. <laughs> we were in France when they, shouldn't go there, but I'm going to. Uh, we were in France right after the Charlie Hebdo thing. <coughs> where the, the guys came in and shot the cartoonists, the people that do the satirical thing. And we had supper at some people's house and they were talking about, well, that Charlie Hebdo had done this <coughs> whole article on no-till and direct seeding. And they drug it out and showed it to us, which meant nothing because we can't speak French. But they, <coughs> they translated the cartoon, and the cartoon, this is in France now, we never do this in the United States, uh, <clears throat> they had this cartoon, in the cartoon, the man and woman in bed, and the guy is saying to the woman, your husband keeps asking me what I'm doing with all the time I'm saving by being a no-till. Ecosystems that leak nutrients for extended periods of time become deserts. Carbon is a nutrient. Saline seeps are symptoms of improper nutrient water cycling. Because the annual crop do not mimic adequately what you can do with perennial, with that native prairie one. So at the very least, we need to throw in those perennial sequences like Grandpa and gra Grandma used to do. And then the nutrient placement is part of cycling. When Anthony talks about all the fertility things, he's talking about broadcast treatment. Right? <clears throat> That's not the most efficient way to do fertilizer placement. Uh, <clears throat> concentrate on having your soil moist during the dry part of the year. We get so hung up on trying to have it dry during that wet part of the year so we can be the first guy to plant that we often run out of moisture later in the season. Uh, focus on having, and this is really important, the soil cool during the hot part of the year. Because roots and those kind of things and soil biology does much better when it's a little cool instead of just focusing on having it warm during the cool part of the year. And when I was in Ghana and we watched, I watched Kofi Boa talk about managing his rainforest. It was eerie because it could have been me talking about managing the prairie. Nitrogen nutrient cycling, using the water, keeping the ground covered, diversity. It was just amazing. Now he's doing it with a machete, but he's tripled and quadrupled the yields of these ladies that run these small one and two acre farms and they now they now can educate their children and stuff. And if you go to Farm Future Magazine's website, there's, a, there's an article there about it. Fertility is what we, we're going to talk about today. We need to have the right weight, the right formulation, the right place, and the right time. We all hung up talking about rate, but we forget about some of these other things. And Anthony talked a little bit about formulation. 
too when he talked a little bit about time, but you got to get into all of those. And why is nitrogen important? Well, if you're a conventional tiller, which I know there's none of them guys here, they'd have left by now, uh, <laughs> but if you're a conventional tiller, you might use 10 gallons an acre for tillage, seeding, and harvest of diesel fuel. You'll lose at 150 pounds of N per acre, you use 30 gallons of diesel fuel to make your nitrogen. Okay? If you're a no-tiller, that ratio is much greater. You know, it's probably five times or six times as much dollars, energy dollars, go into your fertilizer as your tillage and seeding and harvesting. You're not doing the tillage anymore. So, real hot topic for years has been strip till. But when are you going to do that? If you do it in the fall, it's the wrong time. Okay? Is the response that people claim to get from strip till <clears throat> fertilizer response or response to closing wheels? And then what if you don't get it done in the fall? What do you do in the spring? And I've got guys that say, well, then I just broadcast. Well, then you lose the advantage of the placement. Okay? And then you got some other issues. And one of the things about going to other countries, especially where they had, you had you, somebody's translating, some of your jokes just absolutely do not work. You gotta leave them, right? Um, because I always like this one and say, this guy ought to steer better. Right? The auto steer thing, right? So ought to steer better. But <clears throat> that doesn't work. But anyway, uh, I took this picture just outside Mitchell several years ago. Like, how are you gonna follow that? Because you want to be the right distance from your corn plant to give it the advantage. And then you're causing a whole bunch of weeds to grow. We tried, we tried to strip till in the 1980s. And Lee Gatsky and I both did that. Well, he's usually here, but he's not here now. He's a little under the weather, but he's going to be better, I think. But we both tried this in the 1980s and decided it was too complex, too hard. Even with auto steer, going around hills and whatever, just gets to be too hard. But let's take a look at some of these old data. Here's the thing that they did, Monsanto did, and they did no-till, strip-till, and conventional. And gee, the strip-till looked better. Not a lot better, but better. <clears throat> but if you look at, they got three bushels the acre, and if they were getting $1.74, let's say they were getting four bucks today, I take that today. Uh, it's worth five twenty-two for them or twelve dollars for us. The cost of strip till for them was fourteen, it's probably twenty-two now or maybe higher. And they needed to have five point five bushels to make that pay. Is there a better way to do it? And the other thing they didn't tell everybody is that they, when they did their strip till in the fall, they put extra fertilizer on. So the strip till treatment had more fertilizer than the other two treatments. And I said, well, gee, you can't do that. You gotta have the fertilizer be the same. Why do you get that extra fertilizer treatment in the fall on your strip till? So <clears throat> what they did the next year is they come in and did it the way they did it with fertilizer both times. Strip till two was done the same as the no-till with no fertilizer in the fall, just the tillage and then the no-till one. The reason that we quit doing it is we got dry here and we had that disturbance out there. We couldn't figure out whether to plant close to the fertilizer where it was dry or plant away from the fertilizer where we had moisture, right? I mean, it's just like, duh, don't want to do that. So, <clears throat> starting in the 80s, we've concentrated on being able to put fertilizer on with our corn plant and finding ways of doing that more efficiently. Um, we use this coner up here, I actually got a different one on now, but we use this, this fertilizer opener to actually cut the residue so I could move the residue without doing much disturbance. If you don't cut it, it's hard to get a residue manager to pull it apart. And one of the things we did see in Ghana is John Deere bringing corn planters over there, right? You can hire a guy for three bucks a day and for three bucks a day, they, in six days, they can take an acre of rainforest down and have it ready to plant corn. That's 18 bucks an acre. 
how how cheap can you do that with a with a tractor? <laughs> you know, not even close. Fifty thousand dollar tractor to mower and all that stuff is not going to be close. So they're going to they're going to have some issues there. But here's our fertilizer opener three inches away from our our seed. Now, Mike Arnoldy on his planter way long years ago, he had these John Deere openers on this little knocker bar to lean the stocks. And then the residue manager behind you do the same thing. And almost all the guys in Potter and Sully and, and those kind of uh, areas are doing this side band of fertilizer with their planters. So <clears throat> we've looked at this for years. I'm going to show you some old data just to remind you. 28% uh, <clears throat> on top. Uh, put the starter, some, some phosphorus on top. Put a little pop-up. That's what a lot of guys are doing. Broadcast the N and the P. Put a little pop-up on. 194, 23%. But if I put urea in that side band, put the starter in the <coughs> side band, put the pop-up, 207, 21%. And you look at these other renditions and they're wetter and they don't yield as well. And that's very consistent. And these are on our website. You can go through and look at all these <coughs> if you want to. But it's very consistent if you're doing this fertilizer placement. Now, if you came to the farm this summer, we dug up roots for you. Same thing here. If you're doing that side band, whatever, it's never less and it's always drier. Okay, 2009. Pop-up only, broadcast in, 166, where I'm doing the right thing. 194. If you go to the corn belt, one of the things that's really, <clears throat> I'm really I'm really excited about. We've got right now this year we got Ken Ferry, right? Corn colleague. He's talking about the value of starter fertilizer, right? In the Farm Journal. <clears throat> and and then I heard the FDs talking about the value of banding fertilizer. And when I'm starting to agree with Ken Ferry and the Hefty Brothers, <laughs> now all I gotta do is make the Pope a Methodist. And then... <laughs> okay. So if you take conventional till and look at response to starter fertilizer, one out of eleven. If you take no till and look at response to starter placement, eight out of eleven. Okay? So placement. 7.8 bushels. Our numbers are closer to 10. So why is that? Well, where does the plant root go? Here's a corn plant. Little guy, here it comes. This little root here, the radical, it doesn't do much. And as soon as your plant perceives light, then it starts growing these roots here. These roots pretty much don't do anything. And this summer we would dig up corn plants and show people where that little radical went, where the roots were going. They're not going right straight down right underneath that plant. They're going sideways and then down the macro pore. And where you want your fertilizer is right there. Three inches to the side, the same depth as the seed. So when people say two by two, that doesn't mean two inches deeper. It means same depth as the seed. A lot of guys are trying to go deep with their fertilizer and then get mud thrown at them. Get the fertilizer in the ground, same depth as the seed, not a big deal, okay? Soil becomes a dominant pea source once you get to V2, which is here. Up till then, it's, uh, it's, it's really the, the, the seed itself and maybe that little bit of pop-up, okay? So, move a little residue if you want to. Place the fertilizer three inches away, you'll never consistently be three inches away if you do strip till. Your a lot of steers are not that good. You start start getting further away and too close. And what we had happen this year, somebody used anhydrous in a strip till thing and got to wandering. And they had spots of dead corn. Because they wandered back across that anhydrous knife. Okay? Again, just showing you that in case you're a slow learner. Showing you that in case you're a slow learner. 
Biggest problem with this is you've got a bunch of weed seeds now that are going to grow. The other problem with strip till is you get a rain. If you're going up and down hills and you get a rain, you get this. Now you got to get the no-till disc out. <laughs> <laughs> you guys know what an oxymoron is? <laughs> Words that don't go together? Clinical reality, military intelligence, right? <laughs> No-till disc. Don't. Okay. What do you do with that? Now there's a little corn plant trying to grow there. It's a mess. I'd rather do it this way. We don't move a lot of residue. We've changed our closing system quite a bit. One of the things that John Deere did when they sent the planters to Ghana, <clears throat> they got bubble coalers and rubber wheels on the back, closing wheels. So we came home and I called Matt Hagney from Exapta and said, okay, Matt, we gotta get some things over there to Ghana because these guys do not have the right stuff to make them no-till planters work. And we're all, we were planning on where to ship them and whatever, and then all of a sudden we got this kind of email going, we have to make sure that Howard's okay with this. Because he's got an agreement with John Deere. And John Deere may not be happy. And I told the guys, don't worry about it. I, I, I've made John Deere unhappy before. <laughs> not a problem. But this is our closing system. We've got a vertical wheel instead of the Keaton. And we've got a closing thing that's just folds right on the back of the John Deere thing, take two bolts and drop their thing out and put this in there. Uh, <clears throat> what I wanted to show you is people say, well, I'll just go in and I'll put, put some nitrogen right over the row. Okay, and back up one. See how close this is? These are really narrow. They're running vertical. So what I did is I put the end of the side. This all has, has pop-ups. No, oh, this one doesn't, but these all have pop-up. But here we're just looking at nitrogen to the side, where it's going. So we got it to the side with a pop-up. We got it to the side with a starter and no pop-up. And then we, we took the tube and put it right over that row, right between them closing ones. So it's a real tight band right over top of the row. And then the bottom one, we just took that tube out and shot it between the rows, like a broadcast. Look at the difference, 217, 214, 198, 197. As soon as you pulled it out of the ground. Not the same broadcasting. So when, when Anthony's telling you while we're broadcasting it, yeah, that's different. In one of those trials, not the one this year that Anthony was doing, but the one last year that, that <clears throat> Ron Gelderman was doing, the farmer in Potter County, you can see that square on the edge of the field. It was yellow and all the stuff around it was dark green because the guy around the edge put the side band on. Yes? So, okay, where are you putting the pee on that going? Are you rolling that down that tube? Yeah, well, most of my variable rate pee is going down that three inches to the side tube. I'm just putting a little basal rate of pee with the seed here, right? So we've got three, two places we're putting the pee. To the side, a little bit with the seed. Yeah, and here we're putting it over the row, so the N and P are over the row. But this isn't a P response, this is a this is a nitrogen response. And I'll show you that in the next thing. Okay. We have intentionally drawn our oles and P's down to five parts per million or less on our irrigated ground, because it's close to the river. And and be watching in the next five years, you're gonna hear all this stuff about phosphorus going into the river. Right? It's an issue. So we knew this was coming, so we intentionally drew it down. Now we're trying to figure out where we get response. So here we have the nitrogen to the side in all cases, but we, we got starter plus pop-up, 206. No starter, but pop-up, 212. Uh, starter, no pop-up, 206, and nothing. No phosphorus, 204. We get almost no phosphorus response, even at five parts per million. Why is that? Because we've got mycorrhizae, we've got all these things, all this biology going, we've got penicilliums, we've got these huge root systems, right? <clears throat> so phosphorus is probably not as big an issue for us as nitrogen. But there we are going through 20 inch rows, over 200 bushel corn. You can see last year's corn, 
two years ago, that last year's, and then this year's soybeans going in. Okay, you can go through that stuff if you want to. Lots of residue. Now, how do we do some start of feed with the seed, other nutrients placed near the row at seeding time or on the soil surface after crop canopy? And that's only if we have to. Broadcasting fertilizer before or at seeding encourages weed. The big key is this available nutrient, moisture, and roots. Okay? If you've got a huge root system, like we have in no-till with mycorrhizae and whatever, then you can have your available nutrient at a lower level and still get enough in your crop. But when you're doing tillage and you don't have the mycorrhizae and that kind of stuff, then you need more. Or if you've got bad rotations, you need more. Okay? So, that's what wheat growing in high soil, highly infested with root pathogens owing to lack of rotation may respond to phosphorus fertilizer even when high concentration of nutrients are available. <coughs> That's old data. Okay. Biological control of soil rather than having fast weeds is accomplished by not growing wheat or corn or soybeans more often than every second or third year. Okay? So that's just basic stuff. I'm going to show you what rotation does, and then we're going to let you have lunch. If I do just cover crops and I stay with corn soybeans, which is not a rotation, it's a two-crop monoculture. And there's not enough carbon there to drive a good no-till system, so no-till corn soybean doesn't count. But if I, I've got a field that's been no-till corn soybean since 1990. If I put cover crop in there, I get 7.3 bushel acre more beans. Right? So in 213, our soybeans with cover crop was 62.9. We would have gotten 55.6 without the cover crop. But we don't do that anymore. So 62.9 with corn bean. That same year in a rotation that's corn, corn, soybean, wheat, soybean, a little more diverse. First year soybean, this one here, without a cover crop was 76.2, and the second year soybean is 81.3, just simply because the rotation is more diverse and it's got more carbon. It's got that big cover crop. It's giving us energy, carbon, energy need to drive the ecosystem. <clears throat> so cover crop increased yield by 7.3, but more diverse rotations give us 15.9. So if I look at corn soybean 62.9, the average of those other two soybeans in this rotation 78.8. That's a big difference. So what does that mean? Well, let's look at corn, continuous corn. Again, since 1990, 203 bushel, corn soybean 217, and the average of the corn, corn, soybean, wheat, soybean, the average of those two corns is 235. The second one is like 217, and the first one is higher. Okay? So I just look at the numbers. If I have 2,000 acres, I got four into all continuous corn, I got 406,000 bushels of corn, and a big grain dryer and a big grain cart and a really big set of semi. Right? Boy. And if I do corn, soybean, I got. 1,000 acres each, I get 217,000 bushels of corn and 62,000 bushels of soybeans and no wheat. If I do this rotation, corn, corn, soybean, wheat, soybean, I get 63,000 bushels of soybean. More soybeans on 40% of my acres, 800 acres, than I got on 1,000 acres. And that neat. And I, but my corn is high because I get less acres, right? But I get wheat. 48,000 bushels of wheat. What we're doing is we're trading 29,000 bushels of corn for 48,000 bushels of wheat. Would you make that trade today? Chat. Yeah, I probably would make that trade today. Not a bad deal. And then if I do, the more diverse rotation I can have more acres, so I make more money. That's why McDonald's is open for breakfast. <laughs> when soil water storage capacity is lower, much of the rain that falls during extended periods of precipitation is lost. Those to leaching or runoff. In contrast, the high water storage capacity combined with the best to capture rain and snow melt over the fall, winter, and spring can support the brothers who I'm not going to pick up. But <clears throat> they had trouble the first few years too as we're trying to get these soils to recover. But if we do a perennial sequence, then we're recovered, right? 
Within all texture groups, organic matter increased from 1 to 3 percent fill water habitats and doubled. <coughs> Cover crops. There's corn <coughs> with no nitrogen and with no companion crop. Here's corn with no nitrogen with soybeans growing between. Kofi doesn't use any fertilizer in Ghana because he grows companion crops that feed all the nitrogen he can to his corn, all, all that he needs. Roots are important. So is lunch. Thank you.